Hi guys, Mr. Kane here. Hi guys, Mrs. Goswish. All right, um, uh, I do believe that we are going to talk about Bohr and, the, nat and the, the nature of light here today, right? Yep. Okay. So we've seen this before, right? Yes, that is the continuous spectrum. All the wavelengths and all the colors of the rainbow just kind of bleeding into each other. Right, and uh, that's what we get from the sun. We see that. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing is that when you take individual atoms, individual types of atoms, and you get them to emit light, they don't emit a continuous spectrum. Nope. They emit very small portions of a spectrum. Very specific wavelengths, very specific colors. So hydrogen, the top one there, is one of the ones that we'll wind up looking at in the lab when we do a lab. And helium too, I think. Do we not have helium also? And also helium. And um, you'll notice that they, they look different from each other. They're almost like fingerprints of these elements, right? Yeah, you can actually distinguish the, each atom from the other based on what their spectra looks like. And if you look really carefully, you can see that the two blues aren't quite the same shade of blue. They're in a slightly different location. So they have just a little bit of a different wavelength. Correct. The only thing that seems similar is those two greens seem like they might be the same. Yeah, because the reds are a little askew too. Right. So the reds are, while they're still following that red color... They're different shades. Yeah, and their wavelengths will be different. The reason why there are only very specific spectra is because only certain wavelengths, which is to say certain frequencies or certain energies, are present. That's why we get the different colors. Light, of course, is energy. And the reason for that to happen is because each atom is emitting quantized amounts of energy, specific Qu sizes. Quantized sounds like the word quantity. Right. It's, it's, it's specific amounts, specific sizes. So unlike a continuous stream of it, they're basically spitting out a certain quantity of energy, and that's light, and that's wavelength, and that's color. Correct. It's all three okay. at the same time. Um, if atoms could emit any amount of energy that they wanted, any kind of atom could give off that continuous spectrum that we saw at the very beginning, all of the colors. So basically, atoms are very limited to the amount of color they spit out. Correct. I got it. Okay. So Bohr developed this model of, um, of the hydrogen atom to explain mathematically and conceptually how uh, how atoms emit specific colors. The model basically says electrons move at quantized speeds at amount, a certain amount, certain speeds. Um, so that means they have certain amounts of energy. Mm -hmm. These electrons do not lose energy continuously, um, and they don't gain energy continuously. They can only gain it in certain sizes. All right. Um, and that has something to do with Planck's constant. Um, and we've talked about Planck's constant before. Okay, so electrons basically can move up and down particular levels, and when they do, there's energy involved. Correct. Okay. If, if they move up, they wind up absorbing energy. If they move down, they wind up releasing energy. Okay. And it has to be certain amounts. All right. Matter of fact, we'll let you talk about that. In the lower right-hand corner, there's a rendition of Bohr's model with the nucleus smack in the middle. That's the green dot. Then Bohr assigned numbers to the energy levels moving away from the nucleus with that smallest one closest to the nucleus being n equals 1. So that's energy level 1. Right, and then energy level number 2 and energy level 3. And he was under the impression that those energy levels were perfect concentric rings. Okay. So the one closest to the nucleus, the little small one, the 1, the n equals 1, mm -hmm. is the ground state. Okay, so that's where the, where the atom is at ground state. Right. If the electron is in that energy level. Well, the electron has to be in that energy level to start with. That's where it belongs. Okay, because that's the ground state. Right. Okay. Oh, see? Hey, I was right. The electron huh. is in the first orbit. All right. Then he theorizes that in order for an electron to move up energy levels, they have to absorb light meaning they have to absorb energy. Keep in mind, when we say light, we mean energy. They're interchangeable terms. So to go from that first energy level to, say, the second or even from the first to the third, that electron has to absorb energy. And if it wants to go to the third, it's got to absorb more energy. So let me see if I get this straight. The electron starts out in the first energy level here. Yes. And in order for it to move up to the second energy level, it has to 
take in some energy before it goes up. Right, it has to absorb a photon of light. Okay, so this is basically the first, this is basically step two here that I've drawn. The energy is being pushed into the electron and it's jumping up. Correct. Okay, so the electron is exci excited. It can move up to higher orbits. If right. it moves up to orbit two, it's a small amount of energy? Right, the more it wants to move up, the more energy it's got to absorb. So it has to absorb more energy to get to the third energy level. Correct. And even more energy to get to the fourth. Yep. Okay, that makes sense. Bohr assigned an energy of zero to an electron that was completely removed from the atom. That means all the other electrons that are still attached to the atom will have lower energy than an electron removed from it. Okay, all right. So in order to get an electron completely removed, that's a lot of energy. And then finally, can these electrons stay in these high, higher orbits indefinitely? Nope, they gotta come back down. That's not where they belong. Okay. They're unstable up there. So step three, a photon winds up getting emitted and the electron falls at the same time. Right, because the electron's falling from a higher energy to a lower. What's it gonna do with all that excess energy? Doesn't need it in that lower level. Right. So it spits it out. And we gotta have conservation of energy. So right. the electron falling and emitting a photon would be the third step here. Right, so you need energy to get it up third to point. a higher level and it cannot stay there, that's unstable. So it comes back down, it has to come back down. And when it does, it emits that excess energy. And then finally, the color of the photon, the, col uh, the color of the light that's given off depends on how much energy was lost when the electron fall. Larger falls release larger amounts of energy. So yep. they'd be more likely to be things like ultraviolet or x-rays, things on the higher energy end of the spectrum. Yeah, because they'd be more energy. And shorter falls would be lower energy, so they'd be like on the red or the radio end. Right. Ooh, that's a pretty example. Notice, Mr. Kane, how the orbits go away from the nucleus. Again, imagine the nucleus smack in the middle of that first ring. There's the nucleus. Okay, so there's the nucleus, which is positively charged. Around it, in the lower energy levels, in the ground state, well, this is hydrogen, so it only has one electron. Mm -hmm. You put an electron in that n is equal to one. Since this is hydrogen, it has one electron. I could draw an electron in here, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, if I'm going to do a high energy photon, I should do it in purple. Purple. That would make much more sense. So I'm going to circle this in purple. So the high energy photon is purple. So if we're doing a high energy photon, I'm going to draw an electron. It's purple. All right. Uh, I think we said that the first thing that's got to happen is it's got to start at ground state. Right, and it's got to absorb energy to move up. Okay, so there's got to be some energy come in. And notice it's a purple amount of energy because it's got to be a large amount of energy for it to move up. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So it's going to move up, and I believe it, we're just going to have it move up to the highest point we can in this drawing. We're going to move it up to six. So the electron's up here in this first step. Then, in order to actually emit the light, to give off the purple light, it has to fall, right? Right. So, in order to fall, it's got to go back down. I don't know, maybe we'll just go back down to the second energy level. It doesn't have to go all the way to the ground state, right. right? So, when it falls from 6 to 2, it gives off a certain amount of energy, and that's going to be some proportional amount of energy that comes off. It's also purple because it's pretty high energy. Right. So it's going to be a particular fall, it's going to be a particular value for the energy, and going to be a particular value for the wavelength of that energy. Right. If we were going to do a lower energy fall, we might use this electron here at ground state. Now we have to pretend that the other electron's not there because this is hydrogen, it only has one. Yeah. Right. But uh, just for the sake of showing two different situations at the same time, um, a low energy amount of electromagnetic spectrum has to come in and be absorbed by this electron. Right, because it has to absorb energy to move up to a higher level. And maybe it's not as high, maybe it'll only go to the fifth energy level because it's a lower amount of energy. Right, it's a smaller. Okay. Um, let's, make the, let's make the fall small also. Okay. Okay, because we're going to do a low energy photon. We, if we want a low energy photon being given off, then uh, we want it to be only a small amount, so let's fall from five to three, maybe? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. It, it, it might not be in the visible spectrum. 
it might be an ultraviolet light mm. that, uh, that I'm saying not ultraviolet, infrared um, that comes off. But we will get a photon come off based on the amount of energy difference that's here. Yeah. And you said we can calculate this, right? Right. You can calculate the energy that is emitted. You can calculate the wavelength from that energy and then say what kind of light it is. Okay. And if we're going to calculate, the calculation is really simple, right? Yeah, because each ring technically has a value to it. You want to calculate the difference between the rings. It's just the energy of the ring that you're finally in minus the energy of the ring you started in. Right. All and you got to do is a subtraction. We've actually got a table of what those char what those uh, energies are on the next slide. Right. So those you, are given to you. So, so you don't subtract 6 minus 2. You subtract the amount of energy in 6 minus the amount of energy in 2. Right, because Bohr assigned a particular energy to every ring. Now, there's a little caveat here. Right. I, th I think you're talking about the second box here, right? Right. Every time an electron drops, mathematically, you get a negative delta E just by pure math. Okay. Drop the negative sign. Okay, it just tells you direction. Because it's not a matter of uh, it's not a matter of energy is negative. It's a matter of that the energy was being given off. Yeah, and there's two ways of knowing whether you're going to be emitting or absorbing energy. Way number one, if you're emitting it, you're dropping from a higher level to a lower level. It tells you right there it's going to be emitted. Okay. Way number two, when you actually do the subtraction, you get a negative energy. That negative sign tells you it's being released, it's being emitted. Drop the negative sign. All right, so uh, here's that chart that we were talking about. N equals one, N equals two, N equals three, N equals four. So we've got the amount of energy in kilojoules per mole. So a mole of photons would have, um, uh, I'm sorry, a mole of electrons would have 13, 12 kilojoules of energy. How come they're negatives? Um, Bohr assigned them to be negative because he wanted to represent an electron that escaped from the atom to have zero energy. Okay. Um, and the only way to achieve that, if they're absorbing energy, if they're gaining energy when they go out, the only way to achieve that would be to start in a negative spot. Because oh, if, so. if you started at zero, then you'd be getting bigger and bigger, and eventually when they reach the infinity en energy level, they'd have infinite amount of energy. Yeah, so he assigned an electron removed completely as an energy of zero, and then had to represent anything in the atom as less than zero? Right. Okay, They're and the only way to do that is with negative. Well, these are actually the energy of the rings, right? Correct. So if an electron is sitting in that particular ring, it's experiencing that energy, right? Right, it has that much okay. energy. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, all right. All right, so basically, here's, here's a quick calculation. Can we calculate the amount of energy of the light that will emit, be emitted by an electron that falls from the fifth energy level to the first energy level? Well, we're going to use those equations from the previous slide. Change in energy is going to be final, E final, so that's the energy of the final ring minus the energy of the initial ring. So the final ring is the first ring. So that means that I'm going to put negative 13, 12 here, right? Right. And the initial ring is the fifth energy level, which seems to have a number of negative 52.5 kilojoules. I'm only going to write the kilojoules per mole once. All right. All right. So the delta E, the change in energy, winds up being a negative number. Right, because by pure mathematics, it comes out negative. Negative 1259.5 is what the calculator says. Kilojoules per mole. Uh, kilojoules per mole. So that's the change in energy from level 5 to level 1, which makes sense since one of them is 1312 and one of them is 52.5. Right, it's got... It's, it's got, just uh, the difference in. Mm -hmm. uh, but the energy of the photon, energy of the photon is going to be... The absolute I, value. I'll, I'll round to sig figs now. Um, I'm supposed to be in the ones place value, it looks like to me. Right, so 1260 with the decimal place? 1260 kilojoules per mole. With and I need the decimal. Yeah, to make right. that spot. Because yeah. the ones place is the last significant place. So that's the amount of energy that, that's the amount of excess energy that was released. It's going from a high to low. Mm -hmm. It doesn't need all that energy when it's in that lower ring. Right. So when it goes to that lower ring, it has to get rid of its excess energy. Mm -hmm. 
So that excess energy amount is 1260, and it's being emitted, which we already know because you're dropping from a high to a low, 5 to 1, and when you do the math, you get a negative delta E. Good. Got it. Mm -hmm. Now the question asks, would we be able to see this light? We can't tell until we figure out what the wavelength. Let's do the wavelength. Let's do the wavelength. I'm going to write this up. If I can find the stupid thing again. Okay, so the energy of the photon was 1260 kilojoules per mole. I can use that for my last problem, right? Right. It's still you the need same. It. It's the same five to one transition. Right. Um, would we be able to see this light? Um, what's that equation again? Okay, so Planck gave us an equation that equates energy and wavelength. Mm -hmm. So E equals H, which is a constant, C, which is the speed of light, divided by wavelength. Right. Now we want wavelengths, so they just kind of switch spots. All right, so we're going to rearrange the equation. Wavelength is actually HC over E. Right, and we've got right. everything. So H and C are constants. So we'd plug in our H. 3.989 times 10 to the negative 13. And that's kilojoules seconds, kilojoules per, seconds mole. per mole. Then we got to plug in 3.00 times 10 to the 17 yep. nanometers per second. And the last thing we've got to do here is energy. Energy is 1260 kilojoules per mole. And we're going to come up with a wavelength at the end here. The wavelength should be in nanometers. So 95.0? 95.0 nanometers. Nanometers. And the question asks us, would we be able to see this light transition? No, because visible light is between 400 nanometers and 700 nanometers. That's a lot smaller. So no. We can't see it, right? Yeah, no, because visible light falls between 400 to 700 nanometers. We just calculated a 95.5. So this is probably, it's kind of close to violet, so it would be ultraviolet probably? Yeah, probably. It's pretty short, 95 nanometers. 